I am Anna Claudia Sima. I co lead the Knowledge Representation Unit at the SIB. And I'm joined by my colleague Vincent, who is a data scientist in our team and who has extensive experience with working hands on with large language models. So we hope together to be able to give you an introduction, but also to answer your questions. And we will try to keep this relatively high level, but also to build up on complexity because I think we have a very generic audience, so we try to cover as much as possible in the relatively short time that we have. So let's start. As an outline of today's talk, I will first introduce some of the basics of LLMs. Um, what are they? How are they trained? And I think you will be able to see that, in fact, the basics are relatively simple and easy to understand, and perhaps that's also where the beauty of the system lies in. I will give some examples of large language models and also some of their bioinformatics applications. And I will talk about closed source versus so-called open source large language models. I will discuss some of the advantages and limitations of LLMs. And after this, we will stop for a little Q&A and a little break. And in the second part, we will have some hands-on experience, both with ChatGPT and if time permits, with also some more um, code in Python, so really programmatic interaction with an LLM. So the outline also covers a little bit the educational goals of this course, but from my side, I think what is what would be the goal of today is that you leave this course with an understanding of at least the terminology, the high level, uh, concepts that are being sometimes hyped up in the media, whether it's social media or scientific media, and that you are familiar with the terminology a little more than before. So what is a large language model? It is a deep learning model at a high level trained simply to predict the next word in a sentence. So if we look at an example, the way you would typically do this is you would have a text corpus, as a matter of fact, a very large text corpus. But based on this, you train a model to predict what is the next word given a sequence of words in the beginning. So if in the text corpus you would have something like nothing is impossible, and you give the large language model the prefix, let's say nothing is, it is supposed to predict the word impossible based on the corpus. Now, this is called uh, self-supervised learning because there are no labels in the initial corpus of text. The model basically learns on its own through a very high scale fill in the blanks exercise. So what it would do is it would look at the first words and it would try to predict the next one and it would learn that in the context of nothing is, the next word should be impossible, for example. What do we mean when we say large language model? We can look at the evolution of language models over time, starting with what we would now consider smaller language models like BERT. And we can see that we have really a very high growth in the number of parameters of these models, and we consider, at least as of now, that there is a direct correlation between the number of parameters and the ability of these models to learn. So today, the largest models would be in the range of perhaps 1 trillion parameters. The information is not exactly known because the GPT family, which we will discuss in a few moments, is a so-called closed source. So the authors of the model, the, the, the open AI team is not disclosing the exact numbers, but we have some sources that estimated at that. A large language model is also large in the sense of it has seen very large amounts of text. And this can be both text as in internet pages, but also code. So perhaps you're already familiar with this use case of um, large language models used as code generators. So as co-pilots, if you will, that help you 
to write a code to achieve a specific task. And this is because they have been trained to do so by looking at a lot of code repositories online. Now, we can think about two different types of large language models. And the first type that I would like to discuss is closed source large language models. And here we talk about the GPT family. And this is also, I think, the most well known for different reasons. But let's just look a little bit at the history of how the GPT family of models evolved. So I think it's important to note that um, this isn't something that was built overnight. So in fact, the first GPT model was released back in 2018. And what really made this particular model mainstream is the release of ChatGPT back in November 2022. And we will talk about what made this model particularly popular. But we are currently even beyond what is shown here. So today we have recently uh, seen the release of a new model beyond GPT-4, beyond GPT-4.0, now called GPT-01. But these are all sort of evolutions of the same family of model. What does GPT actually stand for? It stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformers. Generative because you can use it in order to generate, for example, text. Pre-trained because they are pre-trained and we will understand in a little bit, uh, in a few slides, a little bit more on how this works. But they are pre-trained on large uh, sequences of text and transformers. What is a transformer? It is, again, a deep learning model uh, based on a very pivotal paper uh, from 2017 called Attention is All You Need. This paper was published by Google and it introduced the concept of attention, which we can easily understand if we look at this simple formula, no, I'm, I'm joking. If we look at an example. So let's see what attention means. Attention is a way for models to understand words in context. So for example, if we have a sentence here saying, the girl and the boy walked home, and sometime later you find the word she, attention is what allows the model to link back this word with the previous sentence, and in particular with the word, the girl. So it is an understanding of a word in its context. And although this may seem like a fairly simple mechanism, it is really the basis of um, understanding words in context. And it is also a way to understand what the models learn. So if we look here, this is taken from a paper, but if we look at a more contrived example, we have the example, the doctor asked the nurse a question. She and the sentence would continue. Now, of course, here it is a bit less obvious who she refers to. It could be either the doctor or the nurse. But as you see from the attention weights, so from these are things that you can analyze from a model, the model has learned to associate she with the nurse. In the other example, the doctor asked the nurse a question, he, you can see from the attention mechanism that the model has learned to associate he with the doctor. Of course, this is a result of the self-supervised learning mechanism. It is not something that the programmer of the model has influenced in any way. It is just that the model learns from the text that it is uh, trained on also biases. So for example, here, the attention pattern um, suggests that the model might be encoding some gender bias. So this is a first example of also things that can go wrong by just learning from text. And we will see some others as well. So we've looked at uh, the family of GPT models. And again, the basis of this is the transformer model. It is a very powerful model uh, because it can be trained parallelly 
uh, massively parallel. And um, we can talk about the model that everyone is familiar, or perhaps not everyone yet, but most people, which is ChatGPT. This was, as I mentioned, released at the end of 2022. It was based at the time on GPT 3.5, and it is an example of a chatty version of a large language model. How this was achieved was basically by taking a base large language model and fine tuning it with an instruction data, with a, what is called an instruction data set. If you haven't interacted with ChatGPT yet, you will have the occasion to do this today. But just to mention here, it is a system where you can really ask anything, even philosophical questions. So here I've asked, what is the definition of meaning? And you can get a nice answer. You can regenerate the response and get a slightly different answer. And it is basically a chatty interface to a large language model. And it has had the most rapid adoption worldwide among the public of all the technologies that uh, we uh, are familiar with recently. So it took only two months for ChatGPT to reach 100 million users, which is very impressive. What is now the secret sauce that has enabled ChatGPT to be more interesting from, for the general public uh, compared to the previous models. Well, the secret sauce, in my opinion, is uh, the reinforcement learning through human feedback. So what this means is that on top of the pre-trained model, human AI trainers provided conversations in which they played the role of the user and the role of the AI assistant. And with this, they fine-tuned uh, the model in order to be more adapted to how a human would like to interact with an AI model. So for all people who work in curation, this is something that is very fundamental also to large language models, even though many people argue that this will replace a lot of work. Actually, it is made possible by the work of the human people behind it. And this is also the case for ChatGPT. So in reinforcement learning through human feedback, for example, you uh, collect a prompt and a labeler who is a human annotator, a person, a curator, if you will, demonstrates, so it effectively formulates an answer to this prompt, and this data is used to fine-tune the model. In a second step, labelers can also rank different answers that the model produces in order for the model to learn what is the most adequate answer in, in response to a given prompt or a given question. So again, here, the, the role of the human has played uh, an important part. And in the end, what happens is the model optimizes a full policy and learns a reward model so that it can sort of um, evolve uh, on its own to learn how to answer different questions. So with that, I think it's it's interesting to, to note that it did take quite a lot of time for the GPT models to, be, to become mainstream. And reinforcement learning for human feedback, I think, played an important part in this. In um, another um, in another line of thought, it is also used for safety fine tuning. So among the things that we would like to prevent uh, Chat GPT to do is things like explaining how to build a bomb. It's probably best to prevent the model from answering this. Uh, preventing biases and uh, racism and so on, which are all things that previous uh, chatbot technologies have been uh, faced with. So these are real problems. And uh, 
it required a lot of um, fine tuning through annotation of data, through human annotation of data to prevent these kinds of scenarios. Now, at a very high level, how are LLMs actually trained? Well, in pre-training, what happens is that words get transformed into embeddings, which are numerical equivalents of words that can be used then in learning, in machine learning algorithms. This is actually typical for any machine learning algorithm working with text. Um, if the word embeddings maybe sounds fancy, but it's just really a way to convert uh, text into uh, numbers that, that represent them in, in a vector space. So here you would have uh, shown a, a vector space of a few embeddings where you could loosely associate it with different properties. So for example, embedding one, which can be this vector, would define how high is the probability that the element there is a fruit. So for example, banana would have a very high probability of being a fruit, whereas yellow would have a very low probability of being a fruit. So this is kind of the way to go from um, text, which a machine learning model cannot directly work with, to numbers that still represent the statistical properties of the text, and in particular, that kind of represent uh, words in context. After the pre-training, a model can be fine-tuned for dedicated purposes. And typically, uh, most applications will take a pre-trained model, which is uh, very large usually. So it is not easy for uh, like any given organization to train a, to train a large language model from scratch. Rather, what you would do is to fine tune it. And for this, you would need to prepare a dedicated data set that kind of instructs the model with specific prompts on what it should do. How would this look like? Here I show an example from one of our papers where the task is to take a question or a, a sentence and to convert it into a technical query over a database. And the idea is you just prepare many examples like this where you give the model the instruction, you give it a context, which is sort of the, um, yeah, the, 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 in our case, the question that we want the model to answer. If you want, you could give some steps that break down how to answer that question and the result that you expect. So this is one of the ways to um, fine tune an existing model. And finally, with a given model, either fine tuned or not, you could do things like retrieval augmented generation, which means you don't just give a simple prompt to a model, but you can add more context, for example, from PDF documents or from a database or from images and things like this when you construct the prompt. So really you helped, you helped the LLM solve a problem, generate uh, the, the answer to a question by providing it uh, some more context. And what you can also do is after the LLM generates a response, you can post-process that response in order to validate it with some control mechanisms. And this depends on the question that you want to answer. But for example, you could say that uh, the answer should only contain maybe words from uh, a domain that you expect or things like this. As I said, pre-training your own LLM from scratch is extremely expensive. And by this, I mean, it takes probably hundreds of millions of dollars to pre-train an LLM. However, we do have uh, an advantage in Switzerland, which is the recent launch of the Swiss Alps cluster, 
um, which is one of the nowadays most capable supercomputers in the world, and especially when it when it comes to GPU uh, infrastructure. It is currently ranking six in the top 500 uh, supercomputer list, which is a very famous ranking of all supercomputers in the world. And I think it where it has just been launched uh, over the past weekend officially. And uh, for researchers, uh, they can propose projects through the Swiss AI initiative where LLMs can be either built or fine-tuned for specific scientific applications in collaboration between ETH, EPFL, and multiple research organizations across Switzerland. So this is a very important advantage. Now, if we take a step back, we've discussed what is the large of large language model, but we haven't really discussed about what is a language actually. And if we step back and generalize this, a large language model is a model trained to predict not only the next word in a sequence, but it can be generalized to predict the next token in any given sequence, not just a sentence, where tokens can be words, amino acids, proteins, genes, sequences. So if we think about what is a language, it is essentially a vocabulary and a sequence of tokens that represent information in that language. And it can be as simple as this. Anything can be a sequence. This is why language models are really powerful mechanisms. This has led to a number of applications in bioinformatics, aside from the text-based applications, um, I've put a link here to uh, an overview of biology uh, language models. And you can see that there are quite a few uh, that not only deal with natural language, but also with so-called protein language, so with protein sequences, with single cell languages, multimodal, so combining multiple things like natural language and single cell, perhaps also with images. And all of these are uh, things that can potentially be explored for bioinformatics applications. A few examples that have been published recently have shown that, for example, large language models can generate functional protein sequences so the idea is here to train on a massive set of protein sequences, and these are readily available in huge numbers, with the goal of reflecting the protein structure and hence also the protein function by constructing these embeddings via the language model. And there are also other examples, including uh, genome editing and anything that has to do with sequences, for example, patient trajectories, in order to forecast diagnosis for patients in time and so on. And there are many different possible applications of this, keeping in mind that large language models can deal with problems that are formulated as sequences, provided that there are sufficient examples of those sequences that a model can be trained. However, we have to pause and also acknowledge that there are limitations to large language models. And here I provide a list of a few. Hallucinations. I think this is something that by now most, familiar, most people are familiar with. So these are scenarios where the large language model produces information that is factually incorrect. So it is made up. And what is worse is that when it's wrong, it's confidently wrong. So you could ask, uh, what is the identifier of a given uh, species in a given database? And it will give you an answer, but the answer will likely be wrong. We will see this in the exercise session as well. There is also a problem related to cutoff dates. This means that the base models are not 
trained from scratch repeatedly uh, very often. So what you will have, for example, when you interact with ChatGPT is a model that knows things up to a certain date in time. So for example, this can be up to September of last year. After this, the model itself did not incorporate knowledge. It can work around this by, for example, quest asking questions over the internet, but the model itself will not know uh, things past its cutoff date. Cost is a big issue, of course. So it is extremely expensive to retrain a model from scratch, both in terms of actual um, financial costs, but also in terms of environmental considerations. So it is a big uh, consumer of power. And you can see for different models, these numbers, uh, for some of them, the numbers are really public. Um, so there are a lot of environmental considerations to think about also when retraining these models and indeed even when using them. Privacy is a big issue, especially when you do not work with uh, open source large language models that you can deploy locally, but rather you send information to a server, which is the case for ChatGPT. So the recommendation is don't put sensitive information in chat GPT. So don't describe medical conditions unless you want these to end up somewhere that you don't have control over, for example. And another problem is the lack of interpretability. So we're not really sure when a model generates an answer, how did it get to the answer? You can ask, how do you know a specific type of information? But the explanation will be just something replicating what a human would need to do in order to get that information, not what the model actually does behind the scenes. The model has learned some statistical correlations. It has done so very uh, well because it has a very big number of parameters which allows it to really do high level things but still it will not be able to provide you an explanation of how it comes up with the answer. Then there is the lack of provenance and attribution for information that is uh, given in the answers. And this can be a problem because for example, if you contribute the information in, in the public space and sometimes not even in the public space, you would like that information to be attributed back to you when it is used by a different system. And this is not currently possible, especially not in ChatGPT. And there is, of course, a lot of problems of, around bias because the systems are trained on text, publicly available text, a lot of text. Um, they will replicate whatever bias is in that text. And so a lot of effort has to be put into, first of all, detecting these biases and second of all, mitigating them. And there are others. So it's a non-exhaustive list, but perhaps these are some of the important points. Some of these can be addressed by using open source large language models. So this includes the Lama family, the Mistral family, and these come in various sizes. Of course, a smaller model is cheaper to run. So for example, a 7 billion baby model, you can run on your laptop if you have a GPU, but the smaller the model also, the less smart. So you would probably have to play a more active role in steering it into the direction of your applications via fine tuning, for example, as opposed to being able to just answer questions, answer your questions directly. For example, seven, 70 billion parameters is already a bigger model. It might be more adequate for a bigger range of applications, but it already requires a larger server. And then the biggest models require even more infrastructure. And this infrastructure, you have to kind of maintain on your own. 
And there are the so-called mixture of experts models, such as mixed trial, where you have a combination of multiple models that are combined to give an answer. And sometimes this leads to better results. Now, you can deploy open source models locally. There is a whole environment of tools that allow you to do this easily. One of the most well-known libraries is the Hugging Face Transformers Library, which is really a very comprehensive resource for open source LLMs. You can contribute models there, but you can also use the ones that are already uh, there. Uh, you can find out a lot of information about the models, including carbon footprint. How long did it take to train these? It, it depends on the contributors as well to provide this information, but it is quite a nice uh, central hub for open source models. Now, open source models are not really open source, meaning that their weights are public, but the data used for training is not always public, nor is the code. We also have a lot of tools that you can uh, make use of in order to interact with LLMs locally. So whether these are APIs or libraries, they help also in the fact that they allow you to easily interchange between different models so that you can find the one that is most appropriate for your use case. And there are different libraries um, that can help you find the right tool for a given application. Some of these libraries, of course, are not mature. The LLM landscape is very young, but they can be a source of inspiration. You can also access LLMs through so-called hosted services, where you would still pay a fee in a similar way as you would to, uh, for example, the OpenAI API. Um, but you wouldn't need to deploy anything locally and to maintain a server, which makes it convenient for some use cases. And finally, depending on your level of uh, comfort with uh, programming, of course, you can use large language models in your own code relatively easily. So here you see in a very basic example of how to use an 8 billion LAMA3 model to do a very basic text generation task, for example, to answer the question, hey, how are you doing today? Of course, in principle, you would use this to do more advanced things, but probably the main effort would be in figuring out what the prompt should look like, while the effort to set up the model is relatively uh, low, so it is quite straightforward. So, to pause for some intermediate conclusions, LLMs are powerful generative models that are trained on large amounts of sequences, whether this be sentences, text, or otherwise protein sequences, genes, and other use cases. You have the choice between closed source versus open source large language models, and this depends mostly on the application. Some are more uh, sensitive than others, so you would not choose a closed source model. It depends also on your infrastructure, whether you can deploy a local model or not, and of course on your budget, because larger models uh, will be more expensive to run. But you should exercise caution when using LLMs and keep in mind that they are still prone to hallucinations. And people have argued that uh, this is a feature of LLMs and that we can't expect this to ever go away. So we can only mitigate this, but we cannot expect this to be solved by design. LLMs can also have potential biases depending on the text corpus that you train them on and also cutoff dates, just a few of the things to keep in mind. 